So in this session, I will be giving you a brief overview as to why we are using the statistical programming language R rather than other statistical packages that you may have come across previously. So the first thing to note about R is that it allows us to do open and reproducible research. So it involves coding, it involves actually writing R analysis, writing R data wrangling uh, using a statistical uh, and data science coding language. It allows us to do research in a reproducible manner and to build reproducible workflows. We can write a script in R that we can then run again and again and again, and others can run it too. So it means that every step of our um, analysis pipeline is fully reproducible. What's really nice about R is that the statistical packages in R that you'll be using, so for building your various statistical models, will these reflect the latest advances in the fields of statistics and data science. So R is incredibly up to date. Um, what I like about R in particular um, is the range of amazing data visualizations that you can do in R. So you might be aware that the BBC, uh, many other organizations too, now generate all of their visualizations, all of their graphs using R. And in many institutions, the next generation of academics, so M-level students, PhD students, postdocs, etc., are learning R skills as part of their core training. So by teaching these skills to you, if you want to go on to develop a research career, you're kind of learning the latest techniques. Maybe you're thinking of a job outside of academia. Maybe you're thinking of doing some sort of quantitative job outside of academia. Well, our coding skills are actually crucial in that context too. They're highly sought after by many industries, uh, but I guess maybe the most prominent ones currently are the Office for National Statistics, the NHS, they've, they've moved to R full of their data analysis, and also the civil service. So I guess one thing first noting is that R is um, you know, it's open source software. There's a, a huge community uh, of open source uh, software out there. Um, and open source software will have a number of um, sort of common themes running, running through it. Um, it it's free uh, typically to, to use. Um, it's free to modify. I mean, that's maybe the most critical aspect. It's free to modify as you want to. Um, and it's built, maintained, modified, and improved by the community, which you're actually part of if you engage in using open source software. What's also really critical about open source software is that you can use it typically outside of university context. You can use it after you graduate. Um, if you had been taught maybe on one of the undergraduate programs in psychology that still use proprietary software such as SPSS, you'll be aware you can't actually use that after you graduate unless you pay large amounts of money for the license. Um, so open source software is kind of uh, used widely outside of uh, academia. Um, open source software is supported by many large corporation, corporations. Uh, so Linux, the uh, operating system, uh, is um, supported by the Linux Foundation, uh, which includes support from Google, Microsoft, Intel, Samsung, etc. And open source generally is used widely across both public and private sectors and has had a huge impact on computing over the last couple of decades. That impact is actually only continuing to grow. And it's interesting, um, I discovered recently that the UK government has actually made a statement uh, to encourage uh, the use of open source software within its various government departments. Uh, they say it's important that you use software that, where you can publish your code. This will improve transparency, flexibility, and accountability. Um, and all of the sort of various um, statistics that are produced by the Office for National Statistics uh, are produced in this reproducible and transparent manner by using open source software uh, such as R to actually, to actually communicate uh, those statistics. Um, interestingly, uh, the Ministry of Justice, so a very specific part of the civil service, have an entire team of researchers who work with quantitative data, uh, and they say we do everything uh, open, i.e. open source, by default. So anything that they write, any analysis they do, any data they published is transparent and it can reprodu be reproduced by others. So there are many advantages of using open source software. Arguably, you can't really be doing open and reproducible research if you're not using open source software. 
open source software allows for transparency and reproducibility in all your data processing, so all of your data tidying. When you get data coming out of um, electronic questionnaires or uh, response time measures, uh, EEG measures, anything like that, you can make all of your data tidying, all of your data wrangling reproducible by coding it using open source software. You can also make all of your graphs, all of your figures, all of your visualizations freely reproducible too using software such as R. And this is really important for uh, not just transparency reasons, but also to make sure that your analysis is doing what you think it's doing, because actually it allows others to spot and correct errors in your code. And there's a very uh, famous case, uh, really came to prominence in about September, October 2019, where um, work in, I think, I think it was in chemistry actually, uh, had been using a Python script. So Python is a language like R, it's an open source language. These chemists had been using a Python script to do um, various bits of analysis uh, in their research area. Uh, and it was discovered rather quickly, actually, that the Python script that many people had been using uh, had actual um, errors in it, meaning that it didn't work the same across Windows, Mac, and Linux platforms. And that error was spotted and corrected um, simply because the software was open source. People could see that it wasn't doing what the uh, original author thought it was doing. So it's a really good way to allow uh, science to correct itself um, you know, by using these sort of open source methods. Uh, you never want to be doing any sort of data wrangling or tidying in Excel. Um, it'll do things under the hood that you're not aware that it's doing. There's a very famous uh, examination recently showing that about 20% of all research papers in genetics contain errors because what Excel was doing was actually converting some gene names into calendar dates. Uh, so you, you don't want, uh, you know, if you're working in that sort of area, you certainly don't want that to be happening. There was another case um, where it was discovered that coding errors in Excel resulted in uh, economists drawing conclusions about what the impact of austerity will be on economies. Uh, politicians then develop policies based on the analysis of these economists. And it was actually found out by a young researcher, I think he was a PhD student at the time, that Excel um, included uh, errors in terms of how the economists had coded things. So it can be really, it can be harder to spot these kind of errors in closed source software because you don't always know what's going on under the hood. So you may have experience uh, in using SPSS up to this point. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, what's the difference between R and SPSS? Why do I want to use R? Why don't I want to continue using SPSS? So if you already, we've touched on a couple of these things. Um, one of them is that R allows you to do fully reproducible research. SPSS doesn't. Uh, the other is that because R is open source software, um, it allows others to really sort of see what's going on, not just in your code, but also in the various statistical models that you're using in your code. And you simply can't do this in SPSS. So this is a nice quote from Greg Snow a number of years ago. SPSS, well, it's like a bus. It's easy, for, easy to use for the shared things, but very frustrating if you want to do something not already pre-programmed. R is a four-wheel drive off-roader with a bike in the back, a kayak on top, good walking and running shoes in the passenger seat, mountain climbing and splunking gear in the back. R can take you anywhere you want to go if you take time to learn how to use equipment, but it's going to take you longer than learning where the bus stops are in SPSS. And in main form, uh, Darren Daly, uh, maybe you follow him on Twitter, uh, captures nicely, I think, the differences between different software packages. Uh, with R being very much this kind of community-driven um, sort of uh, endeavour. Um, staying within the philosophy of R as open source, well, many of the books written about how to use R are open source as well. This one by Hadley Wickham and Garrett Grolemond, R for Data Science, is probably the best book you can read if you're starting off in R. Uh, you can buy the paper version on Amazon, or you can just uh, open that website link to look at the book electronically. 
uh, as this uh, unit develops, uh, as your interest in R and your experience with R changes over time, you might also be interested in looking at some of the more advanced books uh, involving using R, uh, maybe getting into more of the programming side of things so you can build up really uh, impressive uh, workflows for doing your data analysis. It will also involve you writing uh, some code, some functions as well. So this chap, Hadley Wickham, is a name you're going to hear again and again in the context of R and R Studio. Uh, he's described as the man who revolutionized R. Uh, he's many uh, responsibilities, many sort of uh, rules. Uh, he's you know, chief scientist at R Studio. So R Studio is the company that produces a really nice desktop interface for working with the programming language R. Uh, he's the author of a number of key R packages um, and somebody you'll see um, not just on Twitter, but on YouTube speaking at various R conferences. So really, really amazing what Hadley's done over the last few years. Um, R has been around, you know, for, for many years, but it's really, um, you know, its popularity has really taken off over the last um, five to ten years or so. So R is used by a huge number of organisations. Um, Nate Silver's 538 organisation is maybe the, one of the most prominent ones that uses R. Uh, YouGov, uh, which um, predicts uh, general election results, all of its uh, prediction models are actually written in R as well. As I mentioned earlier, the BBC use R for all of their data visualisations. Uh, and this is just one example of the sort of visualisations that they build in R. But importantly, they also make all of the uh, data analysis and data visualisation code that they use to build these visualisations open. So you can actually look to see how the BBC websites, how the uh, various BBC outlets are actually producing their data visualisations, how they're doing their analysis, because they make their code open. And they've actually published a cookbook which will actually show you in R how you create all the different sorts of visualisations that the BBC use themselves. From an employability point of view, uh, data science is recognised by the American Psychological Association as a huge growing employment destination for psychologists. So many companies out there are interested in people with a background in psychology, so people who know about people, but also psychologists who can do uh, research, uh, data wrangling, statistics, data science using cutting edge open source packages such as Python and R. So you're going to be learning a whole bunch of skills in these workshops about how you do things in R that will be hugely useful to you uh, if you want to stay in academia, if you want to go off and do something else outside of academia. Companies are just crying out for these sorts of skills. Uh, not many universities in the UK teach R to undergraduates. Uh, there's just a handful, including Sussex and Glasgow, Nottingham Trent as well. Uh, and there are probably a similar number of universities that teach R on M-level courses. Uh, Manchester, obviously, obviously being, being one of those. So you're going to learn great skills uh, in these workshops for uh, future employability, both within academia, but also crucially outside academia too. Um, I quite like this uh, tweet it came up uh, maybe a year or so ago. If your department teaches quantitative skills in SPSS, SAS or MATLAB, is it really preparing students for quantitative jobs outside of academia? Obviously, obviously the answer is no. And if you look at the graph there, you can see Python and R are sort of the top four skills that are asked for uh, in various quantitative jobs out there in industry with SPSS just, you know, really up the, what, about the 3% mark uh, compared to R, which, uh, you know, kind of is up there at the sort of 50-55% level. So the world of research has changed rapidly over the last few years. Um, you know, some PhD students, some master's students who haven't been aware of the changes, some actual senior academics who haven't been aware of the changes, um, just simply don't know what's happened over the last few years or so. Uh, this tweet um, was from somebody attending a summer school in 2019, uh, somebody at a very good uh, neuroscience um, uh, lab 
uh, at a very good university in North America. And at this uh, summer school they attended, the instructor was saying things like, do you know about Docker? Do you know about Jupyter? GitHub? Binder? Python? He could have added, do you know about R? And this student uh, responded by saying, well, I feel as if I spent the last four years of my PhD in Mars because I don't know about any, about any of these things. Um, and you won't know about any of these things unless they've been taught to you. Uh, and again, that's something uh, that you're going to, a set of skills you're going to acquire from doing these sorts of workshops. Um, so you're not just going to be taught about, you know, what data analysis, what research methods have been used in psychology over the last decade or so. You're actually looking forward. We're seeing and recognising the way in which the world has changed as a result of the adoption of open research methods. And we're going to be using the various tools that are now widely used in industry uh, and are being used more broadly in academia um, that allow us to do research in an open and reproducible manner. There will be coding. Uh, you will be not really doing much pointing and clicking, you know, so we're moving away from that SPSS way of sort of pointing and clicking, uh, where you can, you know, point and click as much as you want. Sometimes you'll get stuff that looks uh, plausible, sometimes you don't. Um, R requires coding, it requires you to actually type commands into the R Studio desktop environment. Uh, it forces you to know your data and it forces you to actually know what you're doing as well when you're building various statistical models. Uh, and that's a good thing. So you, you will be doing coding. Um, you're not computer scientists. I know you're not uh, wanting to become computer scientists, but you will need to do some basic coding in order to do open and reproducible research. Um, and you know many uh, universities uh, and industries are kind of looking for these skills uh, in, in graduates. Uh, in graduates, this will be useful to you. Just going to give you some memes uh, that'll sort of keep you sane over the the, uh, the duration of this unit. Um, when things don't work uh, and they inevitably won't work more than they do work, uh, don't worry, it's not you. That's just the way it is. It's part of the process of learning a new way of doing research. Um, you will be getting errors as you code. You'll be doing a lot of problem solving. It'll be fairly intense. But the skills you acquire from these workshops uh, will, you know, set you up for life uh, if you're doing any sort of job involving research, uh, data wrangling, data analysis. So uh, it, it's all going to be worth it in the long run, even if you have occasional periods where you just, uh, you know, um, really, really don't feel as if um, your, your R coding is working for you. It's all a learning experience. And really, I just want to leave you uh, in this uh, video with this little graphic here. Um, most of the time, you'll be oscillating between these two uh, images. Um, you're probably going to be starting off feeling like, um, you know, the image on the right. That's absolutely fine. Um, I've taught a version of this R course two or three times now. Most students at the start of the course think, I am going to really struggle doing any of this. But interestingly, within just a few months, they're producing data analysis uh, reports that are just mind-blowing. People are able to do things in just a few months that I haven't taught them how to do. They just kind of acquire the skills and really immerse themselves in the language. But even when you become more proficient uh, in R, and maybe you start to feel a bit more like the graphic on the left, uh, you're actually gonna, you know, still regularly be flipping across to feeling like the graphic on the right. Because it's a huge uh, language, there's lots you can do in R, there are lots of different ways of doing the same thing. Uh, you'll always be learning. Uh, I'm always learning. I don't think I've ever come across anybody who uses R who feels as if, you know, like they know it all. You'll be doing a fair bit of Googling. You know, you'll be looking stuff up. That's normal too. Uh, there's some things I simply can never remember how to do in R, uh, and I have to keep Googling uh, how to do those things. And again, this is all normal. Uh, so it'll be a fun unit. Uh, you'll be doing lots of coding. You'll be doing amazing stuff. You'll be getting stuck every now and again. You'll be doing a lot of looking stuff up, uh, but hopefully, uh, and I'm pretty confident uh, that you will be, hopefully uh, you will enjoy this and you'll find these skills really, really useful, not just for this unit, 
uh, but for whatever you do, um, you know, later, later in your careers. Thank you.